What is up, guys? We are live. Thank you guys so much for your patience. We were working on getting our chat working. I wanted to make sure that people got in and started to interact with the chat. And you all have. So, welcome to another episode of the Black Heights Podcast, the On Their Journey Podcast. Tonight, I have a special guest, my brother, Mr. Kenny Stevens. I know Kenny through school. We both went to Florida Atlantic University together. Kenny is an educator and a mentor to the future kids of tomorrow. He is currently a career and technical education teacher at the Spring Independent School District, the Caney High School in Houston, Texas. And he has served as a behavior specialist in Broward County Schools in Florida. He has also mentored many young women and men in high school football, basketball, youth football, youth track, and youth basketball. And last, and not, last but not least, he is the founder and director of Evolution Sports Academy in Texas, which is a, a sports program designed to help kids engage in positive activities outside of their school schedules. That's right, outside of their school schedules. Mr. Stevens, tell everyone how you're doing, my brother. How are you, man? We're doing well, man, doing well. Doing pretty good out here. Awesome, man. Awesome. It looks like we got quite a bit of people in the chat. We got Barbara in the chat. We got Cecil in the chat. We got Ainsley in the chat. What's up, guys? We got Mr. Billy Rowe in the chat. Um, we got Monique in the chat. Guys, what we do here, we got Tiffany and Tam in the chat. Guys, thank you so much for supporting the show. Um, this is an interactive show. So any questions that you have, please do bring them up. We'll try to answer those questions. But before we even start to go to the uh, the um, lightning round, Kenny, you want to do something for us, brother? Yeah. Uh, Kira, you come with the kids? Um, before I put them to bed, we just finished eating and I uh, just want to introduce uh, the most important people. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. So yeah, we we uh we had practice a little while ago and came home my uh, normal routine. So uh, this is my wife, Secura, and this is Matthew, Mr. Actor. How are you doing, Secura? Hey guys, London. London, and I have uh, my oldest, Jaden, and Kaylin. my mini me, Kaylin. <laughs> <laughs> How are you guys doing? You have a beautiful family, Kenny. You have a beautiful family, man. I appreciate it. Appreciate Absolutely, it. brother. Absolutely, man. So, you know, I got the chat going on over here, and I got a small chat going over here. It sounds to me that everybody can hear us quite well. So, you know, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to take it to the lightning round. Man, you ready for that, Kenny? You ready for the <laughs> lightning round, my man? Yeah, I, I seen my brother <laughs> Irwin. So, uh, Ert, Ertwin's in the house, man. Isaiah, welcome to the house. Darcellus, welcome to the house, my brother. We about to have some fun tonight, man. We are about to have some fun. Let me uh, let me do something real fast. Let me um, switch the screens out. Let's do this, okay? Let me get a little bit of camera action on on us. Boom! Look at that. All right, we about to play. Uh, let me get my little timer going. We about to play a little uh, a round of on that journey, man. Okay, uh, let's do this. Okay. All right, you know the game of this or that. All right, ready to kick it off? Cat or dog? Dog. Computer games or video games? Video games. Teacher or coach? Mm. Coach. Ah, football or basketball? Basketball. High school or college? College. Small town or big city? Big city. Fort Lauderdale or Houston? Lauderdale. 
You're a Florida boy at heart. All right. Pop music or rock music? Neither. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, pop music or rock music? Neither. All right. Check this one out. Peanut butter jelly time or my neck, my back? Well, you know, those were both classics when we was in college. So uh, peanut butter jelly time. All right. All right. PlayStation to Xbox. Oh, PS4 all day. Pancakes, waffles. Pancakes. Hot chocolate or coffee? Coffee. Morning or evening? Evening? D depends on what you talk about, man. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were pretty quiet on that one, brother. All right, okay. Day or night? <laughs> That's another one. Night. <laughs> all right, all right. Text message or call? You know what? My timer is not even up there either, but I, I see it. I see it, though. What would you say? Text? Text. text. All right. Text. French or Spanish? Spanish. Summer or winter? Summer. Ooh, okay. We got 50 something seconds left. Look at that. All right. Um, theater or cinema? Uh, cinema. Love or money? And that's the last question. Oh. Uh, hmm. Okay. I think, uh, I think you've got given the uh, the audience a chance to know Mr. Mr. Stevens a little bit more. What you think, man? I think uh, I think I did pretty well. I got <laughs> thirty seconds left. A lot better than Irwin. <laughs> you know, when Irwin was on the show, Irwin was uh, analyzing every single question. You know, he could have he could have went either way. He's an engineer, man. Yeah, that's the thing about it, bro. Yeah, Straightforward. I'm a coach, so. <laughs> all right let us get into this my man so tell us your journey my brother tell us the journey of mr stevens man um well it started a long long time ago in fort lauderdale as you touched on before um came from a small immediate family uh, my mom and dad had just me and my sister uh, but family, um, I've always been around family. Um, as far as I can remember from elementary school, every day I was at my uh, favorite aunt's house, mm. um, every single day, uh, with my extended family, my, my cousins who were more like sisters than anything. Um, and that was the uh, root of my foundation for a long, a long time up until high school. Um, every day, that's what it was. It was us five. So my myself, my sister, and, and then my three cousins, um, all either going to school or in transit together. And um, with my mom, how everything um, took place in life is we depended on them a lot um, coming up. And the family atmosphere was always there. So we never lacked for anything, mostly. And, um, you know, I've always kind of been the favorite uh, or the, the sport one. Being the only boy in all the girls, yep. um, I got away with a lot. But um, I always knew that I was loved. And I just always um, had, you know, a lot of people pushing me. Um, my upbringing was always pushed towards education. And I'm the first person in my family um, from my mom and dad um, side to go to college. And that was a major uh, thing that I always kind of wanted to do. Um, mm -hmm. Others chose other paths and not saying that um, they couldn't have uh, went to college, but I was the one that kind of I guess started it for our generation and then everybody's gone and um, finishing and it's, it's, it's the way that we're going about it and getting it done. Um, just getting that, the, that bachelor's degree from FAU was huge. Yep. And it just, um, it started something for me that 
I, I know that I want to continue. Now, the strange part about that was even me ending up at FAU, um, I was going to Florida State. And I got cold feet, I guess, a little closer to um, the spring. Yep. So I applied to FAU and applied late and got in. And I, I, I was so close to my sister that I didn't want to leave. And if you remember a lot of times when we were there, I would run home on the weekends. Yes, you do. always um, did, man. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I would go home to wash clothes or Sunday dinner. Everybody, why you don't wash your clothes in here, man? My, my house is 25 minutes away. I'm going home. I'm going home to eat. I'm going home to do this. And it's like I was so accustomed to my family and just everybody there that it made it easier. And I don't regret not going to my dream school um, because I made connections at FAU that um, I think I'm going to hold on to for life. And I appreciate them. Um, just meeting you, uh, Erwin. I came in with Darcellus. Um, Darcellus is like a like a brother to me. Uh, we call ourselves <laughs> Uh, right hand, left hand. We got so many mama jokes and, and, and family jokes as we're coming up. Um, but I know if there was ever anything or a pinch that he was always there. And that's always been the way how we've been since we were 13 years old. Yep. So that was your roommate, which made us close. Yep. Because you took my best friend and at the time, my close, one of my closest friends. Um, and at the time, you were his roommate. So we and you started to form a bond. Then we met Erwin. Then JT just came in and it's just the four of us just this that 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 bond that it's just there no matter what. If we talk for uh two weeks straight or we don't talk for two years. It's like when we pick back up it's those those moments were huge. So coming on um at FAU we grew a lot. Yeah. Um, we learned a lot about ourselves. <laughs> we had our fun. We had our ups and downs. Uh, <laughs> we had our wrestling dips and our arguments. And <laughs> so, so many great stories. Um, I know my wife and uh, people get tired of it. We bring up the same stories over and over again. But <laughs> we're getting old, those man. Are, those are the things that made us, man. And at the end of the day, it helped kind of shape us and start us to where we are. Um, I just know that um, when I was coming out of school, I, I didn't go to school to be a teacher. I didn't go to school to be a coach. Um, I'm a business major. Uh, my degrees um, was in business administration and commercial real estate. Um, and I came out at that time. And when we graduated, I just knew that uh, I was going to be the next great South Florida realtor. Um, I was going to sell homes and work on commercial videos and different things. And then I got out there in the real world and the bubble kind of popped. Yep. Yep. And it, it hit a point where I was staying with my grandmother at the time, uh, uh, Barbara Taylor. Hey, I see you on. And uh, she would tell me all the time, hey, you, you got any interviews? You going to go get a job? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, well, I got a job. I'm, I'm, I'm doing mortgages. I'm refinancing homes and and so many things. But at the end of the day, she would kind of tell me, hey, it's no retirement if you're not bringing in anything. You're not uh, doing what you need to do. And it was kind of crazy because uh, my one of my, my well, my closest friend in the world, my my brother. Um, his parents were educators, uh, Cecil McNair. And yep. I think you met him. He came, he came down. Absolutely. So um, he already knew what he was going to school to do. He knew he, he had his plan. And he was he was going to school to be a teacher. His dad was a teacher for forever. And his mom was in education. So he went up to West Virginia, played football, and came back in. And um, 
he had his way in. And it was kind of crazy because I always coach. Um, if you see behind me, I got trophies from my early 20s. Um, I got plaques from coaching with my uncle, um, my uncle Pat. He he kind of taught me what communities was and giving back. He taught me how to, how to coach and spend time with my sons by just watching him do it so long with his. So he got me kind of started as a volunteer and it kind of uh, picked up. So the summer um, before I landed my first real job as a teacher, because I had some some jobs that wasn't too proud of. Uh, I had a, a a job where they came in and made it seem like you were going to be executive assistant or a marketing manager. And I was walking door to door, knocking on doors for AT&T, trying to change people's phone bills and wireless plans. <laughs> and <laughs> man, we will show up to the office at 12, get in cars, drive to a neighborhood and walk for four hours. And I was like, what is this? And we would come back to the office at the end of the night and they, they would ring this bell and how many did you do today? How many did you do today? And it's like, at first it's like, you know, I'm so competitive and it's like, all right, I was trying to be the best at that. But then I was like, Hey, I'm this, this is not what I went to school for. I didn't go to school to walk streets and knock on doors and, you know, uh, upgrade people's cable and upgrade people's cell phones. Like that's not what I went to school for. It's more to me than this. So I was coaching a, um, a local team from the park. We had won the park league, and I had uh, I was working for a realtor at the time, uh, Miss Edith Wright, and she believed in what I wanted to do. So she sponsored uh, my team to buy some uniforms, and she bought us some uniforms to play in. And we went and played in this basketball tournament against some international teams from um, France and Europe, and other places they had came to. Um, well, my first job was Core Glaze High School. And um, I met this the basketball coach. There was a lady named Lisa Ingram. And she she was uh, very instrumental in me getting my first job because she introduced me to one of my closest friends now. And a guy that's kind of a mentor, um, Mr. Tariq Kayim. Uh, we played against each other in the championship game of her um, tournament. He had his high school team. And I had my kids from the neighborhood, from the park, um, we came across Broward County, so they probably, most of them never even been on the other side of university. And I took them out there and, and they had a good time and we played. And after the game, we lost. And he's, <laughs> he's one of those guys, he's never going to let that yep. down. Yep. If, if, if Rick beats me in something, he's always going to bring it up. So when I do get the upper hand in anything, I just don't play him anymore. <laughs> so uh, me and him kind of hit it off and he asked me he was looking for a coach so he asked me would I come out and coach and then that kind of turned into hey well if you're going to coach I need you on campus so um, you ever thought about being a sub and I was like okay and I was kind of leaning to it and then Cecil got hired at Core Glaze Cecil got hired at Core Glaze and it made it real easy for me oh yeah I'm coming that's it so <laughs> Well, well so, 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 Kenny, let me interject yeah. here real fast. One of the things that we, 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 we talked about is you going to school for business admin and commercial real estate. And, yeah. you know, Cecil's parents were educators, so he kind of already knew what his path was. What made yeah. you decide on business edu or, or business admin, right? Uh, uh, focus on business as well as real estate. What got you to focus on those two? Uh, going to school because that's we have people who are in school now that watch the channel and people that's going mm -hmm. into school and if we can give them any advice into what sort of majors to go into um we can do that in this channel so what made you choose those two um majors well uh, when you chose school? for me for me I've, I've always been a hustler um if 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 there's a contest, if I'm selling something, I'm trying to be the best. So 
I've always had a business mindset of how things work, how money is being made, how business runs. So that was the only thing that kind of interested me at the time. I didn't want to be an engineer. Um, and when I looked at a lot of the majors, I didn't want to do anything in finance. Like uh, Darcellus, he was he was going into finance. He wanted to be a banker. He yep. wanted to do that. I wanted to run the business. I can care less about the, the numbers. I want to run the business. At the end of the day, I want to be innovative to create new ways to make make revenue. Mm. I can let Darcellus or somebody else take care of the revenue. But <laughs> let me figure out ways to go shake hands. And if you know me, and I'm a people person. Yep, you so are. Once I, I took my uh, – my test to kind of figure out where to go, it kind of told me, hey, you're moving to Shaker. Business admin is where you need to go. So I'm just kind of following the the, the, the college plan of, oh, you got to choose something. You have to do this. And I just kind of walked into it. And then it's when we took that first uh, real estate class, um, you know how you kind of take your, your different courses and fill it out to see where you want to go. That first real estate class kind of, sold me because I was able to see a different future for myself. I was able to see myself owning um, property and owning buildings. And it's still a dream of mine. It's something that I, I won't leave alone, but I just understood that I had to take a different path to get there. Yeah. So now, now, now fast forward, Kenny, to, you know, you was, you graduated from out of school, the market crashed. Um, yes. And you were a coach and you got a lot of opportunities from doing that transfer yes. or give us the story behind how you jump started your career to be a teacher. I mean, like, cause that is something completely different business admin, well, commercial real estate this, coach now teacher. Well, it all kind of ties in. So, well, when I, when we were in college after you left, and um, we were still there. I made a connection with the women's basketball coach at the university, Chancellor Dugan. And um, she brought me in to manage and run um, the boys' scout team for three years. And I, I, I appreciate those opportunities because it showed me how leadership and how to be in charge. But it also gave me my foundation for discipline, coaching, and everything else. Um, fast forward that to my senior year, Matt Doherty came in, who's my uh, sports mentor, my, my basketball mentor. Um, and when he walked in, I was working in the president's office for um, work study, um, President Brogan. And when Matt came in, uh, we met, I shook his hand and I just, you know, said something to him briefly about, hey, I want to come over and take a coaching internship. Um, if you ever open to it and he seen me in the gym, he's like, Hey, well, you said you want to do something over here. Come over here and meet this guy. And he introduced me to Malcolm Farmer, who was the uh, director of operations. And that's who brought me into the boys side. That gave me my boys foundation because I had always been with girls and girls, basketball, boys, basketball is two different things. But what those did for me was teach me how to teach, how to be an educator. Mm. Fast forward mm. that now, once the connection happened at Cole Glaze with, with Tyreek, I was able to come in and, and I had, um, I started off as a sub. They put me in uh, internal suspension. So I was the one that sit in the room all day with the worst kids in the school. And internal <laughs> suspension was a complete joke before I got there. And, and the first nine weeks I was there, I had it running on its own. I was able to do lunch detention. They would have 50, 60 kids coming in lunch detention. And I had it so organized when they came in, ate their lunch, came out. My regular IS kids were still there. And I was coaching football. They had uh, coaching football at the time and basketball. But football and doing warm-ups of a game, I got hit in the eye with a uh, football and hurt myself pretty bad. And I realized I didn't have any insurance. Mm. And somebody said to me, hey, man, well, maybe you need to go full time and um, find you a, a real teaching job because being a sub is not going to get paid. Mm -hmm. And being a coach at that time in Fort Lauderdale wasn't going to do it either. So I applied for some jobs, and that's how I got my first job. Um, Dr. Cheryl Sender, uh, she hired me um, at Millennium Middle School in Fort Lauderdale, uh, actually in Tamarack. Um, and I thought I was going in to be a reading teacher. That's what I applied for. And I guess somehow, some way, when she called over the Core Glaze, they told her 
what I did uh, for internal suspension over there, and she decided to make me a behavior specialist. Mm. And that changed my life. It gave me uh, more responsibility than I had ever had at that time. And it put me in line with some very powerful people. Um, Dr. Cinder being one, and one of my mentors that passed away, uh, Mr. Philip Patton, who talked to me every single day about his life and how to make it as a black man in education. Um, because so, 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 so we're outnumbered. That's 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 where I want to get to, Kenny. So before we we get there, so the the the, the topic of this uh, podcast is African Americans in education, and mm -hmm. you said a couple things that I want to just dig a little bit deeper into. You said coaching taught you how to be an educator. Talk about how you know coaching taught you how to be an educator. You, you, you said. Coaching girls basketball and coaching boys basketball is two different things, but coaching in general taught you how to be an educator. And a lot of us as African Americans grow up in a world where we're being coached, right? Uh, a lot of the times we're, 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 we're being coached because we play a lot of sports and things like that. Um, talk about how that helped you become an educator. Well, I mean, anytime you coach, you learn to deal with people at different levels. Um, Everybody on the team can't be a star. You're not going to have that all-star team every time, and you have to learn how to meet people where they're at. Um, when I talk about the difference between girls and boys, uh, especially in girls' basketball, I can teach the same play to a group of girls that I teach to a group of boys. Girls are going to run a play robotically. They're going to run it through and through and through. They're going to go to whatever you tell them at that point boys tend to let the athleticism take over and they're going to take the shortcuts. They're going to try to improvise. They're going to try to do more than what you ask them to do until you put rules or restrictions on them. Hmm. So what coaching taught me to do was be able to attack every situation when I'm trying to deliver a lesson or a message to somebody hmm. and meet them where they're at to hmm. be able to grasp their attention, but also be firm and disciplined to keep them and make sure that they are focused on whatever goal you're trying to get them to accomplish. Mm. Mm. You no, know, that's 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 amazing right there. You said discipline, focus, and to be goal oriented. That is that's very very important. Um, let's talk about this. You being a behavior special specialist and the responsibility that that gave you. Obviously, you know you were around some um, elders who were giving you the game. But talk about what being a behavior specialist is like as an educator. Um, all right. So being a behavior specialist, I was, that's not the glorified position. I was the person that when your child got in trouble and we had a school of about um, 1600 at the time as a, a middle school at that time, each grade level probably represented a third of that. And I was over a cohort. So I would, they would come in as sixth graders. I was their administrator for sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. Mm. And as a behavior specialist, it's my job to make sure that they were doing everything they needed to do and assist teachers to make sure they can teach. Mm. So sometimes yeah. when it came to um, the unruly child of making sure they got a lesson, that's when I had to kind of step in. Mm. Well, what being there um, gave me was she started to now give me other roles. Um, mm. She started to now make me um, department chair. Um, I was over communities, I was over committees. And then I uh, started to get involved in athletics. And that's when it really kind of took off for me. It really um, gave me a perspective as a, as a uh, department chair, because now I had to deal with other people's um, curriculum i had to figure out what art was doing i had to figure out what music was doing mm. um i was mm. over pe when somebody was out i had to go fill in a class i had to get my my myself in and then i started to get a business class because we didn't have enough teachers for the day in the subject so i took uh business and then i would teach business to my kids i taught them how to write resumes i taught them how to do interviews uh would make them dress up do different things presentations uh, create business plans. Uh, we would do projects on 
how to sell this product if I was trying to come up with how to be the best at this. Well, what is your process to get there? And I'm gonna just challenge them. Mm. So being that that educator or being that behavior specialist, I learned the kids that <laughs> the kids that really acted up the most were the ones that really wanted to be taught the most. And mm. they just didn't know how to communicate their needs. And sometimes, um, you know, for us, um, when we're in school and we, we don't know how to get your attention, we, we act out. And it was kind of ironic that I ended up the behavior specialist because I was the behavior problem growing up. <laughs> so, 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 yeah. so, so, Kenny, was, can, 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 let me, let me interject. Sorry, sorry, sir. I, I just think that is very important. Um, what you said of kids who act out, they are the ones that are trying to learn the most. They just don't know how to um, tell you. And, and, and yeah. I, I may not have articulated the same way that you did, but I thought that was very important. So let's jump into this. As an African-American male in the education profession, how important is that now that you see you are the teacher looking back at who you were as a student? I know uh, I, 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 that's a tough question. I know it is. So, uh, no, so I, yeah, jump on it, brother. My mom already beat me to it. If you see, she said, God has a sense of humor. He really does. <laughs> um, the teacher stayed on the phone with her. The teacher stayed calling about me. But part of the problem was that I, um, I finished my work so fast and it came so easy. Some of it wasn't challenging. And that's not the case with everybody mm. because I see now that certain kids do act up because they just don't get it. Mm. And then some kids do act up because they're just not interested. Um, me being a, a CTE teacher now, um, I have the class that everybody wants to come to. I have the class that most kids want to come and participate. Um, because we're in there doing things hands on, we're, we're taking field trips. Uh, we're, we're, we're going here, we're doing this. Uh, we're not in the book every day. We're on the computer and then we building stuff. We're competitive. It's, it's, it's always the place to be. And as an educator, you want to make your class the place that they feel safe in and the mm. place that they want to be. And I can say that, you know, my upbringing, the teachers that I enjoyed the most, were the ones that gave me the hardest time. Mm. If you let me get away with murder, I don't remember you. Mm. Mm. And it was funny because when I first got to Millennium and um, I walked in as a behavior specialist, one of my eighth grade teachers was there and <laughs> she had the privilege of teaching my oldest son um, his last year before we moved from Florida. And it was crazy because me and her, we just joke all the time and say, you the behavior specialist. You were one of my worst problems. <laughs> and then she used to always tell my son that he's the total opposite of me. And <laughs> so it was just it's it's, it's it's it came full circle. But I got it, and and I understand the importance the importance of uh, a male role in the school system. Mm. Um, it's not enough of us. Not That's... enough of us. And it's not enough of, of black males in school. And we are the ones that are needed to reach um, the young black men that are being lost because the school system, for some of them, they feel it's not designed for them to win. And at the end of the day, it is, but somebody has to just give it to them in a different light. Mm. I was just having a conversation with a young man today and kind of let him know, hey, I'm not going to start riding you. I know you want to settle for seeds and you're okay and you're a genius and you can use your mind when you want to. And we had a situation that his uh, headphones came up missing. And for most black males at my school, if your headphones come up missing and you know somebody stole your $200 headphones, uh, there's probably going to be a confrontation. And he didn't do that. He responded like a 30-year-old man. He went and looked up a serial number 
He brought in his receipt. He looked for the serial number on the court. And it's just the way he attacked the situation. Strategy. I, wow. Um, I said, your, your argument to getting your headphones back didn't even give the other young man reason to argue. He just gave the headphones up because it was outside the box. It was yep. above how he thought. And you showed me right then and there you're a difference maker. Mm. And those are the kids that I stay on. Those are the kids that I ride the most because those kids are just like me. Those kids, they they don't want to uh, – they don't want to let you know that they are special. Mm. But everybody can see it. Those are the kids that make your day. Mm. Let's let's do this. That is that is that's important, Kenny. Because I want to dive more into that, into why. And I know this wasn't a questions that we talked about, but this is a great conversation. Um, so let's do this. The folks in the chat, what's up, guys? We got Dar Darcellus talking about the Kings. Monique is in the house. Monique says, "Me and mom is." Are very proud of you and your success. Uh, Barb Taylor, Cecil's in the house. Uh, my brother O'Shea, Mr. Duke Jackson, he's in the house. My brother Billy Roke, my brother C. Wade is in the house as well. Ken Stevens said this, what you're going to do today and I am going to get a call from your teacher. <laughs> what are you going to do today? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's my dad, that's my senior. Uh, I can tell you about those. So, <laughs> it's okay to say I used to get beatings. It's okay for you beatings. to say you get beatings. So, <laughs> I think we all grew up in that here. generation, Kenny, yeah. where we got them. Yeah, but this guy would beat me in the morning, and then we would have to ride to my aunt's house, <laughs> and we would have the same conversation. You gonna behave today? Yeah. <laughs> what you gonna do today? I'm gonna do what I'm supposed to do in school. And I would be I would be okay until I finished my work and she tried to give me more work that she wasn't gonna grade. And that's when it was over for me. And I would cut up and I, I used to get notes home and I used to tear them up. And I, you know the beating's coming, but it's like, you know what? I just can't help it right now. So that's what that statement is, yes. Yes, I used to tell you I would be late and, and you would get a call. I don't apologize. And yes, I'm being paid back right now from Kayla. <laughs> every bit of me. Every bit. So, so guys, since you're watching the video, please do like the video. If it's your first time to the On Their Journey podcast and the Black Heights channel, please do subscribe to the channel. We're growing our subscription base. And we would love for you to continue to support us, guys. So subscribe to the channel. Click that subscribe button on the channel. Um, Kenny, we, we wanted to talk about this. Um, you said there's not very many of us in the educational field, men in general, especially African-American men. Do you have an opinion of why that is? And why is it important? Uh, so I'm, I make it a two-part question. Why is well, that... I just and why is it important? A lot of black men are not interested in the politics of school. Mm. And what I mean by the politics of school, uh, I take my, my, my journey out here. Um, for one, I'm not in a fraternity. So I don't have any fraternity behind me. Um, I'm not from Texas. So I don't have a big Texas university on my, on my resume. Mm. So moving to Houston was a, a, a transition for me that I didn't expect because I left from everything in my, in my lap, everything at my disposal, everything in my hands, every opportunity. I left in the middle of the school year. My secretary, Ms. Levels, is, she's on. She was upset because I left spring break. I, I told everybody I was leaving and um, I moved away. And we came out of Houston and I had a master's degree from American College of Education and Education Leadership. I had won championships as a coach. Um, 
I was a department chair. I was a curriculum writer. I did everything other than the sun because Cheryl Sender prepared me for leadership. If she didn't do anything else, she prepared me to be a leader. Mm. And mm. I just came out here and I knew, hey, I'm going to make it. I'm going to be fine. And I came out here and I went six months. Uh, no response. Sent it resumes, going on interviews. I interviewed everywhere and was told that I was too qualified, mm. overqualified. Mm. They were afraid that I was going to come in and take their job so they wouldn't hire me. Mm. And um, again, no connections, no fraternities. And I mm. found the perfect school for me. And I have to thank uh, Mr. David Baxter um, and Miss Aisha Taylor, um, Larissa Thomas, uh, my head coach that I'm out here with. I was at a basketball camp. I was working basketball camps at University of Rice. And somebody was like, hey, why don't you um, go look on this website? This is where a lot of teachers get into coaching jobs. So I went on, just we had like 30 minutes to spare that morning. And I applied. Uh, I sent a resume out, and um, Coach Thomas called me 30 minutes later. And she called me, and she's like, hey, I was just sent your resume. Um, you look qualified. Can you come in for an interview? Sure. Came in for an interview, and when I got there, I walked around looking at the school. This school looked like a college. First of all, the gyms in the schools in Texas, when they say this is a sports state, they don't lie. We have three basketball gyms in our school. Wow. Massive. I don't know if you're high school. Yeah. Yeah, we got four football fields. Hmm. And um, I was blown away. And I wanted the job. And I couldn't get the job. Hmm. And I went back with my wife a week before school started just to kind of see, hey, what's going on? I came to interview. Um, I want to be here. And the principal kind of looked at her, Mr. Baxter. He said, you know what? I'm not giving you a job for you. I'm giving you a job for her. Because this woman got out the bed and came over across the county, 26 miles, <laughs> to see if you were going to get a job. And mm -hmm. he looked me in my eye and told me he's going to help me. And uh, Miss Taylor was the AP at that time, and she was working. And Miss LaRose, who's still there, she always working she was always making sure i was good and set and it was the perfect atmosphere because the school is majority us hmm. and it's where i needed to be at that time it was the perfect place because they needed me just as much as i needed now hmm. Hmm. it helped me grow and it helped me find my new passion which is electronics and engineer hmm. and it was crazy because I just through coaching me and Mr. Baxter had a conversation and he said I have these teacher positions open um, you can't teach business because I don't have the position right now and I had to go and take a test I studied for two weeks to take information technology test passed the test and I was hired and I've been teaching engineering and electronics um, since then now the problem is not a lot of guys that look like me and you want to go through what I had to go through to get to where I am. That's, and, and I just dropped my pen, so I got this level of mic, so everybody probably can hear everything that's going on, even my breathe. But very important segue, Kenny. And let's, jump, let's do this. Let's jump to Mr. Reed's question here. Then we're going to continue on. Um, Darcella says, and this is a good question. As a friend, one of your best qualities is your ability to build relationships. What's your view on the importance of building lifelong relationships? And when you walk into a new, let me get in here, um, environment, uh, is building those relationships international or does it come intentional or does it come natural? Um, it's crazy because I look at the same thing with my kids. Um, I don't know why 
I, I'm anointed and I'm gifted in certain areas. And mm-hmm. like I said, I don't have certain connections, but I have the right connection. Yeah. And that right connection started from my mom with my foundation of dragging me to church when I didn't want to go. Mm. But what it does is I do pray and mm. I pray to always be in the right place at the right time mm. and make sure that I have um, the right interactions. Um, when I go in, I'm not afraid to speak to people and I'm not afraid to let people know what I know. I'm not afraid afraid to let people know um, who I am. And I'm not afraid to admit when I don't know something. Mm -hmm. And if I don't know, I'm going to ask you. And I'm not afraid to let you know when you are better at me acting because I need to learn it. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that I've always had when I go to building relationships. I'm just genuine in that. I'm a people person. Authentic, man. Authenticity. Yes. Mm. You have to be that way. Mm. So it's it's not like I'm going out saying, hey, oh, I'm going to meet a millionaire today. No, I just feel that, hey, that millionaire is going to want to come in the room. And after sitting and watching the room, that millionaire is going to say, hey, you know what? There's something about that guy. Mm. And just like I'm looking at you, I'm hoping that, you know what I'm saying, it's the same way. Yeah. And I just try to be me and 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 just stand out. Mm. No, it, that's that is it, right? I think one of the the biggest things that when you get older, you find it more and you become more confident. Then the authenticity does come out, and that attracts people, right? It is yes. an area where um, we all have struggled with during our lives, especially growing up. And I find. Um, it being very difficult being in a corporate world, being young and climbing a ranks to stay authentic or define your authenticity because there's so many other people that are so different than you to where you find yourself almost trying to emulate people who aren't like you, right? So I want to jump back into the question from the interview and I'm going to jump onto the chat. And this is kind of a combination of lack of diversity into education roles, especially when it comes down to African-American males, but also the corporate environment where we're trying to resolve that as the Black Heights organization. So I want to ask this question because I I haven't asked you that yet, is what are are the areas you think we as a group, African-Americans, need to increase diversity in the workforce? What are the areas we need to focus on? You're an educator. You see it. You are working with young men and women. You are probably in a large, diverse school. What is it about African-Americans, the things that we can do to increase diversity ourselves into the workforce um, from your in your opinion? Well, one thing is that um, I think for one, we need to take it more serious early on. Mm. And a lot of us, we wait until either our back is against the wall or it's too late for us to get serious about whatever it is we want to do. So mm. I always encourage kids to find out what they want to do early, find the route to get there and master that. Um, it's just like in sports. If you want to beat the man in front of you or you just want to beat the man next to you, what's the best way for me to get there? What's the quickest route for me to get there so that mm. I can enjoy myself? Um, also, don't take a job or don't just do something for the paycheck mm. because what happens when you're doing it like that, um, you're there looking at your payment every week or every two weeks. And there's no enjoyment, so there's not going to be an advancement. And there's too many, too much turnover. Mm. So for the diversity to get there, more educators have to know they want to be educators. Mm. And that's what CTE does. It lets you kind of pick whatever your pathway is, and you can start doing that from high school. Um, we didn't have that coming up. And I think the way they're gearing school now is changing it, where there's going to be more, more diversity because kids – get to start earlier specializing in whatever they think they want to do. 
Mm. But I can know within high school whether, you know what I'm saying, I want to pursue that field or not. And that's what we try to provide now. So as a black educator in my class, I know that there are not a lot of engineers um, in the field that are either black or minority or yeah. female. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. I can tell you this. In my classes, they're predominantly male because engineer and hands-on is predominantly male. My best engineers are the girls. Mm -hmm. Well, wow, look at that. That's the, that's the diversity that um, many people don't understand. Mm. My architecture class, my best designer is a girl. My um, design class is a girl. My electronics class of, of uh, solid states where they're building uh, smaller renditions of factory machines, the group has a girl. Hmm. And they run circles around the boys. And I'm going to tell you why. We don't read directions. <laughs> they do. <laughs> and that's because in the males, like I said, coaching boys, coaching girls is two different things. If I'm coaching a team of girls, they're going to do what the directions tell them to do. They're going to take it step by step. They're not going to take shortcuts. They're going to go and complete the process. Males... Hmm. Going to look at the picture and say, hey, I can put this together. I can do this. And now they're going to call and raise their hand. And I do not get up and come and baby those kids. And I set my deadlines. I treat my classroom like a company. I treat it like a business. Mm. And, and their grades are competitive. Mm. First group to finish will have 100. The next group to finish will have a 98. The next group to finish after that will have a 96. So you're teaching so them to so compete forth. at the same time. Mm. Because I give... It's important. When, when we were doing uh, projects of design, I would come in and give the design for the week. This is what I'm looking for. And I would give them like a company. We would have a board meeting on a Monday. So on a Monday, I'm going to come in and, hey, this guy, he wants his pool hall redone. So I would go find a picture of a, a pool hall and show them a picture of the pool hall. And I say, I want it re redesigned with... 12 tables, a gaming area, more bathrooms, eating space. This is what I need by Friday. Who can get it to me? My girl would take their pool table, have the exact replicas of how their tables look that they already have, while the boys would just give me a rectangle with a little square here. Oh, this is the floor. This is the bathroom. And it's like, the attention to detail is totally different, but a lot of women are, discour are um, discouraged from taking place in the engineering world. And I think that's where the diversity needs to pick up for them in that mm -hmm. aspect. So let me let me just recap what I heard you say. Early exposure, right? And take it serious early on. And not only that, not as, as the student, but as the parent to make sure that you're finding a path for your child along the way so that they can have success and lifelong success. Um, compete, right? Um, one of the things one of the things you mentioned was women follow directions very well. I think you may find some males out there, Kenny, that would say they would question that. <laughs> right now, I'll take any male that got a piece of furniture from Ikea in their house. And actually, if it wobble or if it break down in two years. <laughs> Why? If you get some furniture from Ikea and you still have three screws left over when you're done putting it together, then you have it just answer my question. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Let's jump into the chat. Uh, Shirley, uh, Earth's wife says, do you see yourself teaching or training educators to be more effective with their more with our minorities? How do we as listeners of this podcast affect a positive change within our schools? Excellent question, Shirley. Well, I do um, I do teach the kids to always be more effective um, in everything they do. Um, that's the biggest thing. You are your community. You affect your community. You touch your community. 
Mm. Whether you know it or not, your community watches you. Mm. I can tell you this, um, growing up in an era where um, tough environments, drugs, and different things around, I was the kid that was in touch. Mm. I was the kid that they allowed to make it because they saw something in me. Mm-hmm. So I tell them all the time, even when you don't know you're being watched, you're being watched. Somebody's watching you. Somebody's paying attention to you. You're only going to get pulled into what you attract yourself to. So always educate the, the youth to be more effective, not only for themselves, but their siblings, their, their family members that are watching. Mm-hmm. Um, for us as listeners, uh, educators, people, what we have to realize is it starts at home. Mm-hmm. Um Mm. early exposure starts at home well you can't come home and you want to yell at your child when their report card is not up to par but you never offer to help with homework you never check to see if something's done you never go through their backpack you never reach out to a teacher you never go to open house Mm. Mm. you never ask them what they're studying you never have conversations about school, but you expect them to be on their job doing what they're supposed to do. Mm. That's like me sending you to work every day to work for me, and I never come check on you. I know. Mm. How much work would get done, brother? You, you, you're preaching, man. You're, you, all right. Say it again. Where does it start, my man? Say, it, say it one more time. Starts at home. Mm. Mm. And at, at the end of the day, even if I don't have the the ability to teach, I could be an active dad in the school. I can be an active mom. I can be a part of PTO. I can be a part of uh, various organizations. My mom, um, she would always find a way to show up to different things at school. It was embarrassing. Um, <laughs> no. Uh-oh. She's going to call you after this, man. <laughs> uh, it's all right. Um, that's how we are. But everybody's parents didn't show up to different things. Yeah. But I found myself and it was crazy. She laughs because if she said she was coming to something, I wasn't at rest until I seen her. Mm. And it mattered even in high school. Um, I believe the last thing, big thing that I had uh, that I can remember was a concert. Um, uh, I was playing in a jazz band, playing the drums. And uh, it started and she was coming from the other side of the county driving in and the, the theater's dark but I knew when she got there and she knew I knew when she got there Mm. because I played with more confidence. Mm. So those are the things that when, when when you think you're not there, you're not involved, it matters. It, it it matters. It it matters not only in the classroom, it matters in sports. You, You see it all the time when, when, when people's parents show up, that's, that's how they get there. Yep. You know, no, that is, that is, Absolutely right. And as a parent now, I understand how important it is. It is very important um, that you're involved and not just involved in your kid's life, but engaged in your kid's life. And you have to be intentional about what that engagement is and what that involvement is. Um, it's very, very well, I mean, important. That's why, I, why I enjoy coaching um, more than anything is the time spent with my kids. Mm. Um, mm. I, I got a chance to to really coach coach um, thanks to one of my uh, my closest friends as well Marcus McGee he was always tied in he he, he was a a day to day guy with uh, with Nike with Amari Stoudemire and when he moved back to Florida um, he, he brought me into elite basketball and that's when I really got a chance to really see elite talent just being around some of the top kids in America on a weekly basis. And I appreciated that experience. And me and him, you know, we still work together. We still talk to this day. He's he's always uh, innovative. He's always finding new ways to to reinvent himself. He's always finding ways to uh, keep going. But me starting Evolution Sports here, started from being around him Mm. i've seen him start three different youth programs and they all have been successful 
So it's like, again, those situations where you find yourself as a carbon copy of how to do something. Well, if I don't know how, I pick your brain. Mm. I have conversations. And sometimes when I'm talking to you, I'm just talking to you because I want to know so I can do. And, you know, he's always been one of those that <laughs> we have a kindred spirit and we're both go-getters. Mm. We're both go-getters. So that's how we drive each other. And um, I'm thankful for him for, for just putting me in that in that arena where I was able to see so much talent and see how to make a difference. Um, in a daily basis. I even tried to get him to go teach. It didn't work. Hmm. No, that's didn't that, it, that's important, Kenny. It is, you know, the education piece of it. And, you know, knowing now, especially because we were we were those kids growing up. Now that we, we, we look back at it and we say, just like you, you used that example of you were, you were the kid that, you know, acted up in school, right? And now you're the educator. So you get a chance to see it firsthand. And not only that, you can make a difference. And you can make a difference as a teacher, but also as a coach. And that is important as well, because the coaching piece of it is leadership and in correcting behaviors a lot of the times. Um, yes. Putting them into positive directions and correcting poor behaviors to have really good behaviors. And I think that's very important. And not only is coaching important for just, you know, sports and athletics, but it's very important for parents to do as well. So talk about the importance of coaching as a parent. I mean, everybody think coaching as a parent starts with sports and it's not. Right. It's just coaching them to be the best version of themselves. Mm. And mm -hmm. understanding that your your child may not be the star. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they are. But how do you how do you coach them when when they're at the bottom? How do you coach your child when they have a, a deficiency? Mm -hmm. How do you coach your child or encourage them when they don't feel the best at something? Mm -hmm. How do you coach your child when they don't look their best? Mm -hmm. um, I always just say, hey, I look at um, life as teachable moments every day um, in everything we do. Uh, for me, as the mentor, the mentor, I can't be a mentor to somebody else if I'm not doing it at home. Ooh. Me coming to Houston, me, mm. me coming to Houston was, was my grow up, my, my growing up moment, my, my, my LeBron moment. Uh, if you put it like that, when LeBron said he went to Miami to grow up, me coming here was my grow up. Mm. Me coming here was hitting a reset in life. Me coming here was becoming a man um, and, and learning how to lead um, as a man, learning how to, you know, be a husband, learning how to be a better father, learning how to build the things for a solid foundation so that my family can go to another level. Mm. And that starts, you know what I'm saying, at home. Yep. Now yep. that you, you establish it at home, you practice it at home, when you go out, it's easy mm. and it's genuine. Boy, that's important. Me, me getting up talking to other kids. I can talk to other kids because I talk to my kids first. Yep. 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 You want to be that example. Absolutely. And it has to start in the house. Um, we're, we're, we're running a long, perfect timing on this. Um, I have three important questions that I, I, I want to uh asking here but let me do something uh, we had a question from mr sean c in the chat and i don't see it sean if you're still in the chat go ahead and send that question again and i would love to uh, answer that um sorry i didn't get to it earlier but i would love to get to that but in the meantime kenny let's do this what are your thoughts on black heights and its initiatives I oh, always man, ask people I love that it. question. I love everything about it. The first time I uh, kind of heard about it, it was when uh, Erwin was going, mm -hmm. and I was upset with you <laughs> because I didn't, know. because you you know that I'm a light nod and I can help you know grow things. So you should have had me on from the first show. But I think that is something that is very needed, 
it's going to be something that we can go to as a reference for our kids. Hmm. It's something that I'm going to tell my kids in my class that, hey, if you're trying to be this or you're trying to be that, hey, go check out this website. They may have something on it. Hmm. And I think that Black Heights is going to be a Google me hmm. moment when people are looking up certain things. The more that you do it, the more variety of things you have, you're going to be able to have a following like no other. And it's going to be something that should be known as a reference guide for real life and how to get there. So if I wanted to know how to build a gate right now, I go to YouTube. Well, if I want to know how to be an educator, I should be able to go on YouTube or go to Black Heights and mm -hmm. they're going to tell me how to be an educator. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a great platform and I think you, you, you got lightning in a bottle, man. So you just need to push forward and, um, you know, just keep getting better at what you're doing and we're going to support you. And if it's various topics I can be on as many times as I can be on, I'm here for you, man. Man, I appreciate that, brother. I appreciate that, man. You know, my marketing skills isn't the best, Kenny, so I don't uh, post everything on Facebook. But what I do do is I get you on the show to give us these gems that you've been dropping to us tonight, my brother. <laughs> so, Kenny, you you introduce your family, my man. Yes. And beautiful family. How do you balance coaching, being a mentor, being an educator, a teacher, with the family? How do you balance it all, my brother? It starts with my wife. Um, she's wonderful. She allows me to coach. She allows mm -hmm. me to have the outlet um, of sports. And she understands the importance it has for me um, because of my upbringing, of uh, my parents not being together, um, me looking in the stands at games, um, not having people always there. Mm. It did something to me. So now when I'm involved with sports, it's a family affair. So most of the time, our weekends, our afternoons, our evenings are taken up by sports. Mm. Like just today, I got home from school. We had basketball practice for uh, Duke and my wife and the team moms, uh, all the moms chose to walk. Mm. So while we were practicing, me and the dads were practicing with the sons, the moms were working out together. And I just try to make sure that even when I'm going to do something with sports, everybody's there. Mm. Um, I want the siblings there to support each other. But more importantly, I need us there. And mm. I just thank my wife for just letting me be me mm. and do what I do. Because I believe my ministry, when it's all said and done, being that I'm the, the son of a pastor, I never seen myself in a pulpit preaching, but I, I, I do affect the lives of kids and the youth every day. You do, brother. You do. And you have this you have this calm, Kenny, where I'm sure everybody who's watching this can feel it. <laughs> and we can go all night, my brother. We can go absolutely all night, man. Um let me let me do this. Let me jump into the chat because I wanted to get to Mr. Sean C's question. Hello, Mr. Wade. Love the interview. Just wanted to add that we have another black male CEO, Christopher D. Young, CEO of McAfee. Would love to get him on. Absolutely, Sean. If, if you know him, do me a favor. Send me an email at Antoine.Wade at BLKHeights.com and we can make a connection. Um, I would love that. Um, otherwise, what I'll do is I'm going to to track them down. I have a lot of others, the Robert Smiths that I have in the pipeline. Hopefully I can get some of these guys onto this uh, platform sooner or later, but I would love to have that gentleman onto this platform. Absolutely. Um, I'm working on some stuff for you too as well, man. Oh man, you know it, you know it brother. 
Um, my last question, Kenny, for you, brother, before we wrap this up, is for anyone watching this video, what are three takeaways that you want to leave them with about this conversation tonight? There's a lot that we went through. And, you know, I can pull them all out of my head, man. You hit, you hit us with some good stuff. What are the three key takeaways that's coming from your mouth that you want them to remember from this video? Um, first thing and most importantly is uh, know your worth, believe in yourself. Mm. Um, and I say that because uh, when you know what you're worth and you, you do have that self-confidence, you can go achieve whatever you want. So it's not about somebody setting a dollar figure for you. It's not about somebody telling you what you can and cannot do. Um, just know your worth and, and you, you're you going to achieve it. And you might not get it right then, but it's going to come. Um, the second thing is um, always aspire for more. Mm. Um, a lot of us get to a certain level and, and we get comfortable. We get complacent. Mm. Um, and you see it a lot um, with us in our culture that when we've made it or when we have it, then we start working. Um, I joke with a lot of the kids um, at the school. I asked them how many of their parents um, took the day off when income tax checks come in. Mm. And just kind of see the response. So we always have like just crazy conversations like that. And then I ask them when they get older, how many of them gonna take the day off when your income tax check comes in? And then yeah, I hear their responses and so on and so forth. And then I throw a big question at them. And I said, when the CEO of a company hits a big sale, I say, hey, do you think he don't go to work that day? Mm, 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 mm. I say, no, he's already working on the next sale. So you can keep living. And that's, you know, what we don't do. So always aspire for more. And the last thing is just, just make sure that we're always pulling somebody up. Mm. Um, me as an educator, that's my job. Me as a coach, me as a mentor, that's my job to keep pulling people up. Um, my church, they always talk about the types of friends you have, ones, twos, and threes. And um, in many relationships, you want to make sure that you're either a one or a two. Um, I'm, I'm a one to my students. I'm, I'm the one pulling them up. Um, you don't want too many relationships as threes, as everybody's pulling you down. I need a lot of my twos that mm -hmm. we're on the same level and we're kind of growing. And then I have my ones, my mentors, my pastors, my my, my parents, people ahead of me that, that are showing me the way. Um, I got a guy that uh, is a great um, mentor and friend, uh, Mr. Selwyn Brown. He's phenomenal. And, you know, he, he calls and checks on me a lot. Um, showing me the way. He, he, he took me under his wing. Uh, um, my Bishop, uh, Bishop Clark Lazar, uh, Bishop Shelton Beatty, um, they always, you know, pulling me, my spiritual mom, um, Pastor uh, Lazar, Diane Lazar, she's always on me about mm -hmm. walking in my calling, speaking, doing different things. She's always pushing me. Our phone conversations start with well, what's going on in the ministry lately. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and I just shake my head and laugh because I know exactly um, where she's going with it. But I know why. And I know why she's a number one. Um, I know why she's pulling me. And that's because, like I told that young man in my class, um, I see a light on you. Mm. And there's a lot of people in my life that see a light on me. Mm. And they, they just try to pull the best out of me. You know, that's, those are three dimes, my brother. Um, know your worth and believe in yourself. You can achieve what you want. Always inspire for more and don't settle for complacency. That's very important, Kenny, because 
what I see, especially in corporate America or just the workforce in general, you don't find a lot of African Americans in management leadership positions because they feel that those positions aren't for them. To be honest with you, many of us have been coaches before or have been coached. So we have the qualities inside of us to do it. All it is about management and the most important thing is to be able to get the best out of your people, right? That's the most important and the fundamental thing that you need to be able to do is get the best out of your people. And if you emulate some of those things that people did to get the best out of you, you're going to be a pretty good manager. Know that everybody is a little bit different, so you have to adapt yourself to different people. But if you know how to get the best out of people, you are on your way to being a good manager. So that's what I constantly preach on this channel and also to the folks that I'm working with and the folks that are coming into the workforce is ask for more, seek for more. Don't be complacent. And that was a big point that you talked about, my brother. And the last one, which is the most important, is when you get there. Matter of fact, you need to get there because you have a responsibility to pull somebody else up with you. That's the thing within our community that we need to continue to do. No, it's not just for you. It's for your kids. It's for your grandkids. It's for everyone else. And the further you get along, the more that you're going to be able to pull them up with you. So I'm, wonderful I'm, takeaways, I'm my brother. I'm glad you said that about your kids. And the mm -hmm. thing is like everything that I've done um, has been to make a better way for uh, my family. Yep. But I always put them in a good situation. They've always been at schools around me where I've been able to be an active dad, where I've been able to be around and participate in things that they had going on. Those are the things that growing up, I always said, hey, when I become a dad, that's what I want to do. Um, I want to be able to give a difference. My son right now goes to high school with me and just being able to make sure um, he's in the right classes, just being able to make sure he's getting the best, just being able to make sure um, on a game day he has a good meal to mm. eat matters um i don't have to drive across the county i just need to leave on my lunch break and get him something good to eat yeah. to make sure he can perform and those are the things that um being in those positions have helped me um i always say that when i do get my chance because i know i'm going to get my chance that i'm going to help as many as possible but that doesn't mean will i have a campus full of african-americans no you still have to have diversity yep. because they have to know how to interact and deal with everybody. Yep. Um, and, you know, just treat everybody with respect, treat everybody as an equal. Um, I think that's the one part that people don't get is everybody wants to talk about how wrong and oppressed that we have been. But then when we get to a power of authority, um, most of the time we abuse it mm. or we don't know how to level the playing field and just show them how it should be mm. and we always try to make it one-sided so mm. what difference are, are we doing mm. it's, it's no different and that's the thing that i think when everybody understands that everybody is equal everybody is just a person um, the, it'll be such a better place and not only in the schools but in the workforce and everywhere yeah. because it's just it's it's a common theme it's a common problem that Everyone is just trying to be uh, the inferior over or have a power over instead of just bringing up and everybody just working together. Yep. Yep. Absolutely, brother. I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation, my man. I know you was going to be a, a good interview who was going to yeah. drop some some gems for us, my man. Um, yeah, this is different Kenny, man. I know you, you thought I was going to get on here. <laughs> For you all. Brother, brother, I knew that you were going to 
bring a foundation that has been tried and true, but also authentic to this conversation. That is why I wanted to have you on, my man, and just your knowledge in general, Kenny. Um, you're doing a wonderful job at coaching the kids, being a father, being a role model. Um, we're proud of you, brother. And not only that, before we jump off here, tell the people about your business and where they can find you at um, on any of the social media platforms, my brother. Okay. Well, I'm a, like I said, I'm a hustler. <laughs> uh, Evolution Sports Academy. Uh, uh, you can find us online on Evolution Sports Academy, TX.com. Um, that's for my youth sports and training, uh, personal training, personal fitness, my youth teams, one-on-one -on -one training, sports, track, basketball, um, football. Um, I also do graphics and design. I started that last year, Empower Graphics and Designs. Um, it's uh, EmpowerGraphicDesign.com. Mm -hmm. um, we do t-shirts, um, flyers, uh, video edits, different things here. I'm um, helping my mom get her uh, podcast going, and she's going to be on the radio, a fitly spoken word coming up. So I'm in the middle of editing that. Uh, we're getting a, a podcast started, a show. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, me and my me and my college roommates are gonna have a show. Where we're gonna just be having more of these conversations, um, and then I can see myself in in the near future getting started back with uh, my motivational speaking and just from a uh, minister side of a uh, men's group. Yep. And I haven't figured out how I want to do it yet, but I know it's coming. I do uh, send word out every morning. People can contact me via email, uh, evo sports, E V O sports, A C D at gmail.com or evolution sports academy, Texas at gmail.com. Um, those are two of the easiest ways to get in contact with me. Um, also, on the websites that I've um, sent, they also have a contact button where you can send messages. Um, as far as anything with graphics or sports, and I'm willing to help. If you're trying to lose weight and you need a workout plan, you know, send me a message. <laughs> I'll you know, make sure that you. what I'll do, Kenny, is I'll make sure that that is in the uh, the video description so that they can reach out to you, my man. That's what I typically do. Um, guys, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Um, it's been a great, great conversation with Mr. Mr. Stevens here. Thank you guys you. so much. What's that? Oh, my aunt, uh, Loretta Parrish. She stayed up. She said she was going to drink coffee to do this. Auntie, <laughs> I love you. <laughs> thank you so much, Auntie, for supporting. Yes. Guys, thank you Man. so much. Everyone that's in the chat, guys, do me a favor. Like the video. That's really going to help us grow our channel. Subscribe to the channel. That's really going to help us grow the channel. And until next time, well, before we, before that, you can always catch us on Wednesday nights, 7 p.m. PST on the Black Heights on their journey podcast. And until next time, guys, have a good night. Peace. Good night.